could we turn together to the book of <clears throat> Hebrews and chapter 4. Hebrews and chapter 4. It's been a real joy for me to be with you this year and also to listen to the ministry for Brother Harold and her brother uh, Roger also. We want to thank God for their ministry and I really appreciate it and blessed through their ministries. Um, I would like to just read these two two verses by way of introduction. Um, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 and 16, many will be familiar with them. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 and 16. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in every time of need. Can we just unite again in prayer? I know that we have prayed and it's so good just, just to come together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your people. We thank you for your word. And Lord, we come in all our helplessness to you. And I acknowledge that freely, Lord, in your presence. And I ask, Lord, that you would be gracious to us, that your presence would come amongst us in power, that we would become really conscious that Jesus is here. Lord, we ask for your conscious presence, and we pray that you will do us good, and that you will change us from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. I would like to speak to you for a little time on the subject of prayer. I by no means claim to know a lot about prayer. I am grateful to God when I was a young Christian that after being converted three years, I became very unhappy in my Christian experience. I knew I was converted and I attended a local assembly which would be called Plymouth Brethren. And I was very grateful and have always been grateful to God for the folk that helped me in so many ways. That I got a foundation in the Bible. They were lovely people. But there were many issues in my personal life that were unresolved. And I couldn't get the answers uh, in, in, in the assembly. And God knew in my heart that there was a hunger. And the Holy Spirit had planted desires after God. I had no idea that I would end up in ministry. But God had planted desires. And he does that when he comes into our hearts. He, he commences desires. He starts to lead us because the gifts that we have are given by him. And when the Holy Spirit comes into us, then those gifts begin to be activated. There is something there. And many people testify to the fact even who become missionaries or into various aspects of the Lord's work, how that in their early days there was a drawing toward a particular direction because it was the Lord. And the Lord has a plan for our lives. But of course, after conversion, I became, as I said, very unhappy. And why I was happy, unhappy was I really had a divided heart. I didn't have a, a, a settled, united heart to follow the Lord. My heart was divided. I had a heart that wanted to follow the Lord, and I had a heart that wanted to follow the world. I wanted to be my best for Jesus, but I still lured and longed for the world. And I was to discover that it couldn't work. It was only doomed to failure. And God in his providence brought me through failure, deep failure, and as a result of that deep failure, in, and the failure came from personal failure, but also God culminated or brought it all together through sickness. And I went into a deep, deep phase of depression as a young person in my late teens, early 20s, and literally fought for my life for perhaps a year, a year and a half, when suicide was always, always before me. And I, by God's grace and help, I managed to fight off 
the real drive toward that. But during that period, God give me um, help. And while I was in darkness in one part of my life, yet there was amazing light coming in another. In the darkness of despair, in a sense, yet in that wilderness that I now look back and recognize it to be a spiritual wilderness, there's some things beautiful about wildernesses. Wildernesses are places where, where God helps us to be not distracted. Often God's great servants were put in wildernesses. It was in order to keep them from distractions. You see, as a young person, I was no different to others. I had ambitions, I had dreams, I had, you know, all the, all the tinsel of the world was calling for me. But you know, in a wilderness, the tinsel doesn't really touch you. Because God gives you an opportunity to think. He gives you an opportunity to consider, what is life all about? Why am I here? Where did I come from? Where am I going? You know, the drive, the spirit of this age, the spirit of this world won't permit us to think about those things. But a wilderness will. God's wilderness. And what I'm getting to with this is very simple. I became so discouraged and so disgusted with myself that I said, what must I? I genuinely didn't know what to do. Uh, my assembly had told me they had all the answers and I realized personally, well, it's not working for me. I really don't know what's wrong. Uh, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven, but I am definitely stuck. I mean, this is not working for me. And in God's providence, a gentleman said to me, there's a prayer meeting being held in the, the city near where I live, and there are a number of men, and they pray. And I said, well, I have gone to the prayer meetings. I mean, we had midweek prayer meetings. And oh, did they drain the life out of you? They were, they were, oh. Anyway, that was what I accustomed to prayer meeting. Prayer meetings were these, these purgatorial experiences that you had to go through in order to eventually attain the kingdom. And you were just so grateful when somebody cried out or banged a hymn book or said, Amen. You just felt such elation whenever it was over. And that was my experience of prayer. And so these people said there's prayer meetings. I thought, prayer meetings? Surely that couldn't be the answer. But nevertheless, the, they, they, these, these people said to me, no, these are really good prayer meetings. <laughs> All right. So I went along to the prayer meeting. There were only four or five people. I was very fortunate. I was only 21 years of age. The next one to me was 40, 50. And there was a man in his mid-60s. We were quite a crew because there was one was a Baptist, one was, I was tight brethren, there was a loose brethren, there was a, a Baptist, and then there was a Pentecostal. So we were strange bedfellows. But the one thing that everybody had was a desire to know Jesus. That was the common bond. We had a desire to know Jesus. And I was just a child and among them, and I realized that. So they prayed. But when they prayed, this presence came. This lovely presence came. It was just a little room. We, we met. It wouldn't have been out to that picture and around here. That was the size of it. And, and we had a tilly lamp. A tilly lamp, if you haven't heard of one, it's one that works on a, on a, on a wick. There was no electricity. We had a super sir heater. Some of you, the Americans, won't know, but a super sir heater was kind of like a prehistoric machine that you used with gas. And in the top of it, there was a button, but ours didn't work. And the Pentecostal man, he put, used to put a wrench into it, and, and the wrench would hold. And then when somebody was really praying, it would go ting, and then everybody would say, it's gone, and we'd all jump back. But we knew the wrench was going to come down again and fall. It was prehistoric. But in that environment, this presence would come down. And I can remember times as a young Christian when that would occur, and I didn't know why it happened. But all that I could recall was this happened when I was converted. 
This is the same presence that I felt when Jesus saved me. When the evangelist preached, this is the presence that was all around me. And I, I really felt God showing me my sin. I really felt convicted. And, and then I went into a church scenario where it was all theologically good and correct. And I was told that we had everything right. But there was this absence of this presence. And then in this little prayer meeting, here was this presence. And one particular morning... We met, what we used to do was to just sit and chat. Well, I listened because all these men were either preachers or had been elders. So, so I just sat and listened to them and they shared what God was doing in their hearts. And some of them were missioning and, and, and we would meet. And then we, then we would start, everybody would pray. And during that little prayer meeting, it lasted maybe an hour and a half. We met at most mornings. This presence came. But it came in a manner that was concentrated. I mean, it was, it was way beyond anything we had experienced before. And, and I can remember feeling compelled to kneel. And when I knelt down, I looked around and all the other men were, were, were knelt. And I looked around and my Pentecostal friend, he was the singer. He was the oldest man. He was a real true Pentecostal. He was a true Pentecostal. And I looked round and he had his hands in the air. And the tears were running down his face. And he said, God is here. And I can honestly testify today that that, that changed me. That really changed me as a 21-year-old. Because I encountered the presence of God. Years passed during that period. God taught me a lot about consecration. That I needed to give my life unreservedly to him. And my mentor was Leonard Ravenhill. I was given these tapes and I just lived. Leonard Ravenhill, I listened to his tapes. And then once I listened to them, I couldn't go and do anything. You had to pray. Once you listened to Ravenhill, you had to pray. And you just prayed and waited on God. And, and he became my friend. He was my mentor, my teacher. I felt I knew him. And God does that in our lives. God can bring either a liberal person in the sense they literally come into your life or a book or a tape. He can bring something into your life. And God, that person, that thing becomes your friend, your mentor, your teacher. And then God as quickly can take them away. And you've got to be willing to let them go. I learned many years ago, God chooses my friends. I've never chosen a friend. I let God choose them all for me. Because he makes the best ones and then you never have a fallout. You don't have the same problems. Well, where am I getting to? Let's get a little step further before we look at this verse. During that period, God really showed me that I needed to give myself unreservedly to God. We, we, we heard that today through the, through the little leaflet that we were reading, the importance, the absolute necessity of giving ourselves to God. And God dealt with things in my life that I didn't know were issues. For example, idolatry. Now, I was in the Brethren. I didn't believe I could be an idolater being in the, in the Plymouth Brethren. But you see, my problem was that I was very fond of motor cars. There's nothing wrong with being fond of motor car. But the Holy Spirit, when I began to seek God and say, God, why is it that you're not real to me? Why is it that, Lord, I don't have a hunger for you? Why is it that I, don't, I, I can't pray the way I should? Why is it that the Bible seems such a foreign book to me? And the Holy Spirit showed me. He said, you're an idolater, Adam. He said, Lord, but I'm in the brethren. I mean, Roman Catholics... Or, you know, if they're bowing down to me. But, I mean, I'm in the brethren. We break bread. I'm baptized. I have done all that. I'm part of the assemblies. How could this be? And the Holy Spirit clearly showed me. Well, he said, it's your motor car, Alan. You see, you get more joy out of washing and polishing your car than you do out of reading my word. And that was true. 
You get more joy and satisfaction out of hoovering and polishing your car inside than you do out of praying. That was true. God said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. In other words, no gods in my presence. No other gods in my presence. And I never wept when I was converted. But I wept as a Christian. When the Holy Spirit showed me what I was doing. As the light was switched on. And things, God began to put his finger on things. Restitution, I had to write letters. I had stolen things in the past. The Holy Spirit began to show me, Alan, you need to write a letter there. And you need to give that money back. And I did that. And the Holy Spirit would just keep pointing things out that needed to be dealt with. And I would keep dealing with them. Because I had a hunger after the Lord. And eventually, the Lord seemed to bring me to a place where I didn't have anything else to deal with at that time. And I thought, well, what do I do now, Lord? And, and, and I was given a book by A.W. Tozer on, on how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And there were seven points. And I went through them. And to my amazement, the first six were already done. I didn't realize God had brought me right down to number six. And I came to number seven, and it was really difficult. The Lord said, ask. You know, we're so used to doing, it's hard to trust. We're so used to helping God, it's hard just to lean on God. And God brought me to the place where I just said, Lord, okay, I, I receive the Holy Spirit. I just receive the Holy Spirit in his fullness. I receive that gift that you give, that you desire to give. I receive that. Did I see flashing lights? No, I didn't. No. The one thing that I want to point out to you that occurred was in the relation or the area of prayer. That was where I saw the most profound change. You see, prayer to me was painful. I didn't enjoy it. I really didn't enjoy it. I endured it. And Harold has already pointed, it, pointed that out. But you see, what happened, what really triggered a lot of the praying and, and led me, I suppose, ultimately into the ministry was something that used to happen. It doesn't happen so much now, but it happened a lot then. It used to happen virtually every week. And it was only the Holy Spirit. I wish it would happen now, but it doesn't. I realize it's only in God's timing. God is his purposes. But I was on the farm. My dad was a farmer. And of course, I would be out in the tractor and I would be doing work on the farm. But at the side of the farm, there was a little porta cabin. This little cabin where, where uh, uh, my, my sister had, be, had lived at a time. And so there it was. It was just a little house sitting vacant. And, and you could go in and read or do what you liked in it. And, and I used to pray in it. And what began to happen was that even when I was out on the tractor or out on the farm, suddenly this... I can't explain it. This supernatural desire would descend on me. And it would be so powerful that it would, I would have to drop everything. I, I remember turning the tractor off. No matter what I was doing, I just abandoned the tractor. I ran for that shed because I knew that God was going to come. I knew that was going to happen. And every time that I would, that would occur, I would go to this little place or wherever I could find. And it never was in a, in a real vision, but it was, it was like a template, like an outline of the British Isles. It was all ever God showed me, a, a real clear outline of the British Isles. And, and I would see that. And I would begin to cry. And I would cry until, honestly... There were times when I thought my heart will stop. I thought my stomach will turn inside out. It was like going into convulsions. Why? Because somehow I could see all the people. I could see them. Millions of them. All on their way to hell. I could see it so clear. 
And I didn't know there was such a thing as revival. I mean, I had been in the brethren. We didn't talk about that. And God birthed something inside. And it has never left me. It's never left me. And that's why I want to speak to you for a little while about prayer. You see, in the verses that we've read together, we have the approach to God in prayer. The Bible says that we're to come boldly. You know, despite all the experiences of my Christian walk, good and bad, still I find that if I feel the Lord, there is a sense of not wanting to come to God. A sense of deep guilt and condemnation. That even when I come to him, I still feel I, I feel God and I shouldn't have. And he doesn't love me the way he used to. I promised that I would never feel him, but I have failed him again. And, and surely he couldn't love me as much as he used to love me. I, I am a failure. I'm, I'm such a failure. But you know, friends, the Bible tells us that we're to come boldly. The Bible tells that we're, we have to come with confidence. And, and why we have to come with confidence is because the Lord knows that our arch enemy, Satan, will use fear and condemnation to keep us back. You see, what I'm learning in my Christian life is this. The enemy wants to cut the link to prayer. The enemy wants that fellowship with God to be severed. And he uses so many methods, time wouldn't permit me to tell them all. But for example, in the book of Psalm 66, we read that if, my, if, if our hearts... Oh, let me, let me get it for you. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So if the enemy can get iniquity in our hearts, he's cut the link. You see, that's what Satan did in the Garden of Eden. He cut the link. Man became independent. Man said, I'll do it my way. And God sought to win him back by the blood of the Lamb, bringing him back into his presence so that God could fellowship with him. God wants fellowship. God wants to be your friend. He wants to reveal his heart. He wants you to experience his person filling your personality. You know, I often think of Adam. When Adam was in the garden, do you remember when God made him? He, he made him out of the clay of the ground and, and man, man was lying there. And the Bible says that God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. But God didn't make any creature like that. He didn't make the elephant like that. He didn't make the giraffe or the donkey or monkey like that. He didn't do that. You see, he created them. He spoke them into existence like the sun and the moon and the stars. And when they opened their eyes, they saw creation. That was wonderful. But when Adam was created, God breathed into his nostrils and man became a living soul. And when Adam opened his eyes, guess who he saw? God. And he could have seen the universe. He could have looked at the stars first. And that would have been brilliant to see God's handiwork. But God wanted Adam to understand from the beginning, you're mine. And I want to have a relationship with you where you and I can live face to face like, like Moses. He, he talked with God face to face. I want a friendship. It's a friendship based on obedience and yieldedness. And God says, as you obey and you yield to me, I will give you my grace. I will give you everything that's in my heart. I'll impart it to you and I'll set you free. It was it George Matheson that penned the words, make me a captive Lord and then I shall be free. Help me to yield up my sword, then I shall conquer me. The secret of success is death, failure. Many Christians have been to the cross, but they have never been to Pentecost. They're in between somewhere. I think it was Leonard Ravenhill who said, so many people come to the cross, but you've got to get on the cross. 
And it's when we die, you see, Jesus died and you and I have to die. But guess what happened after Jesus died? Three days later, guess what happened? He rose again. When you die, you get resurrection power. You can't get resurrection power until you die. That's the order. God wants us to come with boldness into his presence. He wants to come with reverence. You know, Solomon, the Bible says, when the great temple was dedicated, that he bowed himself to God. Paul, in, in Ephesians chapter 3, he said, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. The presence of God. Often the greatest experiences of God come through prayer. I had the privilege of being in prayer meetings through the years with people who knew how to pray. I remember one old brother who used to say to me, Alan, I learned far more about God in the prayer meeting than I ever did in any other church service. Because as you go to a prayer meeting where people are truly seeking God, you begin to experience God. Another old brother used to say to me, Alan, always remember when God's in the prayer meeting, it's never the same. You ever in a prayer meeting that it's the same every week? That's the indicator God's not there. You bring the same people together that have a hunger for God, that are desirous for holiness, they're abandoned, they're open, they're humble, they're waiting, they have all those credentials that attract the Holy Spirit. When you find those people yielded and open to God, whether they're Anglicans, Methodists, Baptists, Brethren, whatever the denomination, doesn't really matter in that regard as long as it's sound doctrine. But you know what? God comes where he's wanted. God comes where he's wanted. And will you meet those qualifications for getting God's presence? God will turn up. I remember being over in uh, Ireland. I was preaching in Monaghan many years ago. And uh, I'm pretty green still, but I was a lot greener then. And I preached in Monaghan, and to my shame, I thought these people will not know much about revival. So I'll, I mean, I'm here to educate them. I'll, I'll come from the north of Ireland to the south and I'll help them. And there was this little man sitting and he had a little yellow face. He was so ill looking and a little crowd. And I talked to them and I told them that I'd read a book by, on Evan Roberts, the revivalist of Wales. And I told them about the revival and what God had done and, and all the things that had happened. And boy, I thought I had them well educated. And when it was over, I went, this little man happened to be sitting beside me and I said to him, Brother, did you ever read about Evan Roberts? He said, no, but I met him. <laughs> and so I went quiet. He said, I spent a whole day with Evan Roberts. I said, did you? He said, yeah, I was a student uh, in the Bible college, but he had left. And he said, I went over and with other students. We spent the day with him. I said, that's wonderful. I said, did he? Did he talk about the, whenever they used, you know, he had to climb over the seats and climb over the people's heads to get to the pulpit? Did he tell about those times when the Holy Ghost would come and he would fall prostrate on the ground and weep and people would testify and sing and the, that the, the police stations were closed down because the policemen had nothing to do and they formed choirs and went around singing in the churches and the churches were open most of the day and most of the night? Did he, did he tell all about those things and the hundred thousand that could save and how that God showed him that, that, that the, the gates of, of heaven were going to be open and the gates of hell were going to be closed and the Lord showed him there would be a hundred thousand did the Lord mention did he, did he mention any of that he said no I'll never forget his answer he said he only talked about Jesus Boy, he had a lot to tell. But he only talked about Jesus. There's something about the presence of God. And no matter how much of God's presence we experience, we know there's always more. But that becomes often a, a pinnacle, a marker for our Christian experience, how we encounter God. 
And as I've said very often, more times than not, it occurs in prayer. Either collective prayer or personal prayer. That's where God often shows up. And you find that men and women of God who have, who have been used and developed Christian character, you find that more and more as they testify and as they talk, more and more their personal time with God becomes more important. Because you see, the reason why often in our praying that we have problems and praying, and, and let's be honest, there are problems, but quite often the problem is that we're lonely. None of us like our own company. We all get bored with ourselves. You see, the reality is often when we go to prayer, we're bored because we're on our own. But when his presence comes, it all changes. It really does. The approach to God, we must come with reverence. Here he says, come boldly to the throne of grace before a king. The Lord says, I am a great king. Sometimes when we go to prayer, it's difficult. Even though you're filled with the Holy Spirit, even though you've had great encounters with God, there are times when you come when the enemy is against you. I mean the Spirit of God can be with you. You, you. you don't have to confess sin. There's nothing there that's grieving the Lord. But you are surrounded by a kingdom of darkness. And that can be suffocating to your soul. It's very interesting. Our brother mentioned the Lewis revival. My wife is from the Isle of Lewis, the Isle of Harris. And her mentors, as a young Christian, were all converts of the Lewis Revival. And Duncan Campbell stated on a number of occasions that whenever they had seen revival in a parish or a district where God had come and where many had been converted, they would move to another parish. And Duncan Campbell would say, in the midst of the revival, it was terrible. The meetings were dead. They were absolutely hopeless. And he would have to bring in men that knew how to pray. Do you know there's methods in bringing God's presence? There are methods. Your church, whatever denomination or group you're in, you don't have to have dead meetings. Any church can be changed around if the people are prepared and willing to pay the price that's necessary to bring God's presence back into the sanctuary. That can be done. That can be done. But sometimes it's hard. And, and you know what we have to do? We have to praise. Sometimes just praise the Lord. Sometimes just worship him. Sometimes sing to him. It's a vital ingredient sometimes for breaking through. I've been in prayer meetings that were so dead you just wanted to get out of them. I mean you just, oh please. And somebody else would then begin to pray after maybe an hour, an hour and a half, and you think, oh, brother, please, let it go. Please, just let her go. I'm tired. I want to say the last prayer here and get us out of it. And, and you know what I mean? You ever been and And you just say, and then, unexpectedly, with your heart in your boots, some brother or sister maybe sings a little chorus or maybe says some little word of praise, and suddenly the, the thing ignites. It just lights up. Suddenly God has come. And you just feel your heart coming from your boots right up into its right place again. And you're ready to praise the Lord. And time goes out the window. Those times are wonderful. I wish they happened all the time, but they don't. You see, friends, it's when the presence of God comes... It's when he breaks through. You know, our fathers use terminology that we don't understand. In fact, those terms are rarely even used. They're forgotten. Talked about the battle going to the gates. They talked about breaking through in prayer. That's a foreign language to the evangelical church. Breaking through means nothing to the average. But my friends, when the presence of God comes 
on the people of God in prayer when they are waiting in his presence and pursuing him. There are times when God by his spirit so enables and moves his people to pray that the powers of darkness are dispelled and God's mighty presence comes through with joy and praise and power and witness and faith and God turns everything around. Prayer is the key to a work. If your prayer meeting's dead, your church is dead. Over in Ireland there, I'm sure you have heard of the uh, Asher's Bakery. We have still a, a large number of Christians. Thank God for that. But you know, there recently in the Odyssey, it's a, it's a building in Belfast, big arena, and it seats about 3,000 people. So the man who owned the bakery, the Christian, came and, and he, he reported it was very good. And the people came and they gave toward the Christian Institute. Fantastic. Praise the Lord. If I'd have got a chance, I'd have gone myself. 3,000 in, 1,000 turned away. Isn't that great? But a brother said to me, if that had been a half night of prayer, you wouldn't have needed the Odyssey. I tell you, the toilets would have done. A.W. Tozer said, whenever I drive past a church, he says, and they're putting an extension on, he says, I know one thing, it's not for the prayer meeting. It's not needed. Duncan Campbell said, if you go to church on a Sunday morning, you'll see how popular the denomination is. Go on Sunday night, you'll see how popular the preacher is. Go to the midweek and you'll see how popular God is. Well, I don't want to bring despair or discouragement. I want to encourage you because I know many, many come from little homes and fellowships and all where it's, it's difficult. I understand that. So I'm not here to discourage. I really want to help you. I want to encourage you to approach the throne of grace. I want to encourage you to get together with people of like mind and like spirit. To come to the throne of grace. Listen, you can talk and talk and talk till your head falls off. You'll not get any further. You need to come and bring God into the discussion. You need to bring his presence in. God can guide. God can lead. God can turn things around. God wants to encourage your heart. He wants to lift you. He wants to help you. He wants you to know that he is with you. And so praise is a vital key. The will of God is paramount in prayer. This is the confidence we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. If I ask according to God's will, he hears me. He hears me. And the Bible says that he will answer. Sometimes people have a clarity with regards to God's will. Over the years, God has given me promises concerning things in my life and in my wife's life. There's a number of things. They're very precious to us. Have they happened? Not at all. In fact, they're further, they're further away now than they were 20 years ago. Will they happen? Yes, they will. Why will they happen? Because God told us that they would happen. And I believe him. I don't go and pray and plead over it anymore. I just thank him each day it's going to happen. The will of God comes through his written word. You need to get into God's word. Listen, there's no substitute for the word of God. There's no substitute for reading the word of God, for listening to the word of God, for absorbing your mind and your heart with the scriptures. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Joints and marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Holy Spirit comes primarily through his word and he will never contradict his word. But there are times when the Holy Spirit will reveal his will supernaturally to your spirit. I often think of Philip the evangelist. Can you ima imagine being in revival? Up in Samaria, revival, boy, things is happening. He's got saved and they're dropping like flies. And they're solidly converted. These are not false professions. These are real McCoy. This is real converts. The church is booming. There's praise everywhere. People are giving. It's a lovely environment. And the Holy Ghost says to Philip, leave it all. Well, I thank God that Philip had enough spirituality to hear the whole voice of the Holy Ghost. That was good, wasn't it? And the Holy Ghost says to him, go south, go down to a wilderness. 
You can be sure when you're in God's will that there are times when God will ask you to do things that one, you don't understand, and secondly, men will not approve of. But he obeyed the Lord. And he's standing there in the sand. He's wondering, what in under goodness am I doing here? Do you ever feel like that sometimes as a Christian? You've obeyed the Lord. What am I doing here? And then there's a wee dusty thing in the corner. And then he sees this, this chariot coming. He says, oh, there's a chariot flying by. And the Holy Spirit says, join yourself to that chariot. And the Holy Ghost comes. And you see, friends, little is much when God is in it. If God is in a thing, it's more powerful than an atom bomb. Because one with God is a majority. You need the will of God. Very quickly, you need pure motives. You need pure motives. The Bible says you pray, you, you ask, and you receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. You know, when I was a young Christian and was trying at the praying, doing my best, I was very fond. It was an old car called Vauxhall Cavalier. Does somebody remember them? Vauxhall Cavalier. Well, there was a bigger, better model called the Vauxhall Carton. Do you remember them as well? It was bigger. And so I had, the, I had the Cavalier, and I wanted a carton. And I was in the meetings and so on, and, you know, and I prayed, and I said, Oh, God, please help me to get a carton. Please, Lord. I did, honestly, I did. I did that. Please, Lord, help me to get this car. And I prayed about it, but I had no faith about it, and I had no certainty. And, but, I, boy, if, if, if begging could do it, I did it well. I begged with God. I pleaded. And it, he didn't seem to answer. He didn't seem to take you know, heed. And so I got tired of that, and I thought, I better use another avenue to get at God because this is not working. And so I, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, you know that I bring young people to the meetings. I did, honestly, I did this. You know, Lord, I bring young people to the meetings. And Lord, a carton is a little bit wider and I could fit one more in. And I get one more person to the meetings, Lord, if you would give me that bigger car. And he never gave it to me. Ye ask and you receive not because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it on your lust. You see, the problem wasn't that I wasn't praying. I was praying. I was fervent. I was sincere. But I was praying with a wrong heart my heart needed dealt with as a christian my heart needed completely turned inside out god needed to do a lot of internal surgery so that my heart could be changed to be yielded to his will and whenever our hearts are yielded to his will god does amazing things when we yield ourselves to him, do you know what happens? God puts his heart in our heart. God puts his desires in our desires. And we desire what God desires. And when God gives us the burden for to do something, that burden isn't ours. It's his. And when it comes to us, we can pray it back. And we'll get the help of the Holy Ghost. Because we're praying back what God gave to us. You see, friends, you need pure motives. You need the Holy Ghost when you come to pray. You need the Holy Ghost. The Bible says praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Sometimes when we pray in the Holy Spirit, we may sob. Sometimes we may speak freely as friend to friend. Sometimes it may be a sigh. Sometimes it can be absolute silence. I have to confess that some of the greatest times in my personal experience as a Christian have been in my study when I have said nothing. And I just lay down in my study and I said, Lord, I just want you to know that I love you. I just want you to know that my life is yours, that I'm holding nothing back, Lord. I'll go to Africa if you want. I'll go wherever. Lord, I'm available to you. And I just want to tell you that I love you because you first loved me. And you have saved me. And you have forgiven me. And you have taken away all my sin. And Lord, you have made me your child. And you've given me a lovely family and a lovely home. And Lord, I just praise you for who you are. You're so holy. You're full of love. 
love. You're a God of grace. You're a God of mercy. And sometimes my heart, it just seems to kind of bubble up out. And you just praise him. And when you're praising him, you can just feel his presence. And it's lovely. It's really lovely. The Holy Spirit helping us. Very quickly as we close, faith. The Bible says, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye have already received them, and ye shall have them. Let me illustrate this one point as I close. Many years ago, I had been praying for a home. Forgive me for using personal illustrations. I really don't want to draw attention to myself. God knows my heart. So forgive me, but they're the most powerful ones, so that's why I'm using them. I remember praying to the Lord. We had, God had given us a lovely home, and I was praying because I was brought up in the country as a farmer's son, and I loved the country. And for a year, I prayed. Every day, I just asked the Lord. I said, Lord, I'd love to live in the country. But Lord, if it's not your will, I don't want to live in the country. But Lord, if it is your will, I'd love to live in the country. And you're laughing, but that's the way we need to pray. I said, I often, and I still do it, I say, Lord, there's things that maybe I want, but Lord, they're not good for me. So Lord, keep them from me. And if I go into a fit, if I cry and sob, and just let me go through it, I'll be okay. But don't give me what I shouldn't have. Please, Lord. But give me things that you know are in your will, and I'll be happy with them. So that was the way I prayed. Cut the story short, a year later, the Lord spoke to us. And he told us that he would, the verse was, Behold, I, I, I go before thee, I send an angel before thee to guide thee in the way and bring you to the place I have prepared for you. Well, to cut the story short, God brought us to a location, a long story, got us to where we were going to start a house. Well, we had sold our existing house and we had bought the land and that was it. And now we had to go, obviously, I was going to go and get a mortgage in order to build the house. And when I was just about to go and get the mortgage, the Holy Spirit says, don't do that. I said, Lord, hold on a minute now. This is what I did the last time. But the Lord says, just because you did it the last time doesn't mean you do it this time. Because I do all things new. Don't think because he worked somewhere the last time he's going to do it. That God does all things new. He's the God of the original. And, and so I said, all right, Lord. So we sat. And my wife said, and I said, this is ridiculous. We have sold our home. We're living in this tiny little place that you couldn't change your mind in it, much less change your clothes. And I'm sitting in this little place, and I'm saying, my wife said, what, are, what is going on? God has told us to do this, and now we have got this beautiful site, but we can't put a brick on it. I couldn't put Lego on it, much less a house. What do I do? God won't let me get a mortgage. So we prayed. Do you know what the Bible says? You have need of patience after you have done the will of God. God may lead you to do something and then it'll sit static. You've got to sit there in faith. You have to patiently hold on. You're not out of his will. You've got to learn patience. And there's no other way to learn it other than waiting. The man said on one occasion, Lord, give me patience and give it to me now. <laughs> Doesn't come that way. God spoke through a lady. She came to visit me. She was at the prayer meeting one night and she said, she was a little, far, little farmer's wife. She said, Alan, I need to speak to you. Rather, not a farmer's wife. Her husband was a bus driver, I beg your pardon. <laughs> and she says to me, Alan, I need to speak to you. I said, yes. She said, I have seen your house. I says, I beg your pardon. I mean, I haven't got a house. She says, I've seen it. Now, this was a little old-time Pentecostal, no-nonsense an old-time praying woman that knew God. And boy, did she know him. And she could bring God down into her home and into the meetings when she prayed. She said, Alan, I have seen your house. And she said, there's so many windows in the top and windows in the bottom, and there's trees down here. And she started to explain. And I thought, this can't be true. You have never seen even the plans. I have only got the plans. I can't afford hardly to pay for them, but I only have them. But in detail, she showed me exactly what was on the plans in my house at home. And God gave us 
such clarity. And the night before I met her, I was lying in bed in this tiny little house. And I said, Lord, I'm tired of this. I really am, Lord. I need you. Lord, I need you to do something. What are you doing? You have us tucked in here and you told us about this other. You won't let me get a mortgage. What am I supposed to do? And just like that, Jehovah Jireh. I said, Lord, that, I know what that means. I said, Lord, if that's really you, if that's you that has spoken, that's what I'll call the house. When it's built, I'll call it Jehovah Jireh. The next night, the little woman, called, she told me about the house. And then she said, Alan, there's one other thing God told me to tell you. And that is, you see this house that I've seen, God's going to provide for it. Boy, that was the night after. It's not good. For months, nothing happened. And I bought lime. You all know what lime is. And this is where I'm getting to with the verse. I'm just doing it to bring a truth to you. I used to go around with the lime that laid out the lines for the foundation of a dwelling. And what I would do is I would buy a bag of lime. It was two pounds. That was all I could afford. And I would go with the lime and I would put it around where the house was to be, the exact room. And quite often when I come home from church or come home from preaching, no money, a house sitting, well, no house, just lime. And I just come home and I walk around it. Now, God is my witness. God is my witness. And I walk around that little bit of lime around that house. And I say, Lord, I really thank you for this house. I'm really grateful, Lord. And I thank you for the roof on it and the windows and the kitchen and the tiles. And I just went down. I just thanked them for it. And I went on around. And then I went into the house and I went to bed. You say, well, how could you do that? Well, it's very simple, as long as it's God's will. When you're in God's will, you get faith. God gives faith with his will. But if you try to do it without it being God's will, you're in big trouble. Big trouble. And walk around it, used to do that very regular. And then one night or one afternoon, this man arrived at the home. I hardly knew him. He said, I need to speak to you and your wife. So we sat down. I thought he was going to tell me some problem he had. He said, God has spoken to me. Oh? He said, God has spoken to me. And he said, I'm going to pay. And he mentioned a figure to give to you. And it paid well over half to three quarters of the building of that house. So we were able to get there. And there's a lovely house there now. The rest of the story, I'll not bore you with that. What things soever ye desire when ye pray. Believe that ye have received them. You see, when the Lord makes something clear to your heart, whether it's a material item like that, or whether it's the salvation of a soul, or whether it's a move of the Holy Spirit, it's the same principle. What things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye have received them. And you know, I believed God, I, it was nothing about me. I just believed it was going to happen. I, it was no problem to walk around and just say, well, it's going to happen. It was no problem. Just as other promises God has given to my wife and I, it's really no problem to say, that's going to happen. It's no problem. There's not a trace of it happening, but it's going to happen. But the Bible says, what things soever ye desire when you pray, believe that ye receive them. And eventually, you shall have them. You see, you can receive the promise from God. You receive it by faith. But it might be a period of time before you actually get a hold of it. And when you receive it by faith, you don't have to pray anymore. Oh, please, God, do that. Please, God, do that. What you have to do is to say, Lord, I thank you that that's coming. I really praise you, Lord, that that's already settled. That's done and dusted. And I just praise you, Lord, that that's coming. Because that's the prayer of faith. Friends, time's gone. The presence of God is, as I've said, often discovered most and experienced most in prayer. And the thing personally that I want to experience more in my Christian walk is more of his presence. 
and more of his presence. Because at the end of the day, when life is over, ministry, work, it's all going to go. Leonard Ravenhill said a thing on one occasion about a great English preacher. The great preacher, F.B. Meyer, I think it was, said, I, I couldn't survive if I didn't have my pulpit. Ravenhill said that was a very foolish thing for a great man of God to say. Because the reality is you're not going to always have your pulpit. You know where we have to get to? We have to get to the place where Christ alone satisfies. Where if there was no ministry, no nothing, that we could still enjoy his presence. If we were never known, it wouldn't matter. Just enjoying his presence. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for your grace in our lives. Thank you for all, Lord, that you mean to us. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would forgive me in any way, Lord, that I have distracted or taken people's attention away from you, Lord, or away from who you are, and away, Lord, from what you do and knowing you. And I ask Jesus that you would just turn all our attentions toward you, Lord, that we would just know you better. And Lord, that we would experience you in a very real way. In Jesus' name, amen.